is um, spend some time talking about HIV and AIDS. I'd start off with sort of a little bit of a global overview in terms of where things are to some degree with the epidemic. And then what I thought I'd do is spend some time sort of bringing you into some key aspects of the molecular biology of the virus, but in particular focus on how specific aspects of that biology impinge directly on neurons specifically. Because, of course, when you think of, think of HIV, when you, when, you, when you think of AIDS, you tend to think of it in terms of the collapse of the immune system. So the primary focus is typically on immune system cells. And while those are primary and key targets for the virus, they do not represent the only targets of the virus itself. And in fact, as we'll see in a few minutes, there's a whole range of secondary effects due to both viral infection and also viral proteins that have a direct impact on neurons. And so that will tie in directly with what has been described as the neuropathogenesis associated with the virus, which many of you may have heard of as AIDS-related dementia, that sort of cognitive decline that's associated with the disease. So what we're looking at here is, in fact, a scanning electron micrograph of the surface of a, of a human T4 cell or T cell. And what you're seeing are, in fact, virions that are budding from the surface of the cell. So as this implies, when a T cell is productively infected with HIV, it produces an enormous amount of virus each and every day. So that one thing to keep in mind is that HIV infection is a very active process. It's a very aggressive and sustained process in the body. But before we talk about that pathogen specifically, um, as I said before, I thought it would be worthwhile to talk a little bit about the epidemic. And specifically, I'll start off with the state of affairs with HIV and AIDS in the United States just very broadly. Now, some of you probably recall that in the late 90s, there was, in fact, a great deal of excitement surrounding this disease because, in fact, from the year 1996 to 1997, there was a decline in AIDS deaths across that year of 42% in comparison to the previous 12 months. And this remarkable decline actually led to the cover of Time magazine that some of you may recall, posing the question, has AIDS been cured? Because there was an enormous amount of excitement that perhaps there was a therapy available, which is still available today, that may make AIDS sort of a livable disease, something along the line of diabetes, where, of course, it's a serious disease, but over time, you can, in fact, prolong the lifespan of the individual with the disease. So in particular, this was due to what's been described as combination therapy, which represents a cocktail of three different anti-HIV drugs, with the notion that if you hit the virus from three different vantage points, there's almost a vanishingly small probability that the virus will be able to resist all three types of drugs. And in the late 90s, it was thought that really, this might be the cure that that we were looking for. Because it, in the late 90s, what was observed was that on combination therapy, you could suppress virus replication to such a degree that in many patients, you could barely detect it in the bloodstream. Hence the dramatic fall off in deaths. Because of course, if you lower the virus that much, you also lower the symptoms and the risk of progression to full-blown AIDS. What is unfortunate, and I'll touch on this later, is that while in the late 90s combination therapy showed enormous promise, what we now know is that even though the principle of hitting the virus from three different vantage points is a very valid one, unfortunately HIV is so mutable and changes so rapidly that after four years resistance does emerge. So that the virus can, if you will, evolve under this triple sort of um, um, selection pressure to actually resist even combination therapy. So something that I'll probably uh, um, touch on later if time allows is that what is unfortunate is that there was so much promising results in the late 90s that in fact there was a dismantling of many of the AIDS patients support structures that many hospitals have with the thought that well now it's sort of a livable disease. What is unfortunate is that virtually every patient on combination therapy will experience failure of that therapy within four to five years. Question? Did that impact 
Um, <clears throat> fortunately, no. No, no. Fortunately, there was not, uh, there was not an impact on research because <clears throat> there's still so much that we don't know about the virus that that, that was still moving on s sort of full bore. The real impact was on the clinical side of things. But so even though I'm digressing a little bit, this will come back in terms of some, some significance later. What's important now is that we are in a sort of a desperate race to develop new therapies for the virus that are in some ways described as salvage therapies. Salvage, because once you're failed combination therapy, which is the gold standard, we need something entirely different that works in an entirely different way to salvage your therapeutic regimen. So that is still ongoing today. So unfortunately, AIDS has not been cured. And at this point, as of the end of last year, over a million men, women, and children in the United States alone are living with HIV infection. Last year, there were over 45,000 new infections in the United States. And what's interesting is that in the United States last year, women accounted for almost a third of new HIV diagnoses. So as you probably know, initially, HIV and AIDS was considered to be a gay disease. Actually, prior to it being called AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, the first name that the disease had was actually GRID, or gay-related immunodeficiency. So what's quite interesting is that even here in the US, where it first emerged um, among gay men, what's interesting is that women are accounting for an increasingly significant um, percentage of new diagnoses. Most of those women getting that by uh, intercourse or by drug, drug, IV drug use? Um, I would say the majority are, are by sexual transmission, but there is a critical connection to intravenous drug use in that it's primarily um, sexual intercourse with intravenous drug users. So there's sort of a combination there. Question? All these stats are for the United States? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. U.S. only. You have a question? Um, <coughs> the new infections are mostly people that are like over 50, what you're been reading about in the paper, or is it, is it, or are there some like people, or is it young, young um, adults who ah. are sexually active in high school, and then later on they hit their 20s and they're getting sick? Right. No. Um, so, so the bulk, the bulk of new infections are below the age of 45. They're they're below the age of 45. With adolescents, they are a particularly key component of this, because um, at this point, the number of infections in adolescence is doubling every 14 months in the United States. And part of the problem is that even though there is some sex education and, AIDS, and HIV and AIDS education in high schools, many adolescents feel that they are not at risk, despite all of the information on MTV, in high schools, on billboards, they still feel they are not at risk. Because of course, as you all know, Many adolescents, most adolescents, have this notion of being so young and invulnerable to all of these things. Um, also, what's interesting is that there was a recent poll of thousands of not just adolescents, but actually both adolescents and adults younger than 25 years of age, and they felt that it was far more likely, far more likely, that they would be hit by lightning than acquire HIV. So there is still this perception that the risk is not out there, uh, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but what's interesting is that quite clearly, the rate of new infections in the, in the United States has been steady you know, for the past five to seven years, quite steady. But the demographic of those new infections is in fact changing. So that what's quite interesting is that if you break out what's happening in terms of the epidemic by race or ethnicity. What is interesting to note is that since 1999, among new AIDS cases, 61% are in African Americans or Hispanics. And among new AIDS cases in women, for the last two years, 80% were in African Americans and Hispanics. So we're seeing that by ethnicity, there is a very particular shift towards a segment of the population that only accounts, in the case of, uh, of African Americans, they account for 12% of the population. But they're clearly vastly overrepresented in terms of new cases. 
so that amazingly, in the age group of 25 to 34, AIDS is now the number one killer in the United States of African American women. So that what's quite clear is that in terms of demographics, African Americans in particular are being especially hard hit by AIDS and HIV. Perhaps one of the contributing factors is that the African American community was very late in responding to the disease. As you know, AIDS is highly stigmatized in general in, in the US and actually globally. It's particularly stigmatized among African Americans. And so there was a real resistance, for example, on the part of community leaders to even discuss or deal with this new disease. So unfortunately, we are reaping um, some of the problems from that late start in terms of thinking about the disease. So that HIV incidence among African Americans is now eight times higher than among Caucasians. And of course, as one might expect as well, the death rate due to AIDS. So in, in other words, if you were to compare a Caucasian that is HIV infected versus an African American that is HIV infected, the death, the death rate is three times higher for African Americans, in part, of course, due to poor access to health care. So unfortunately, what we're seeing in the US, f for African Americans in particular, is an unfortunate convergence in terms of poor access to health care, a very high rate of new infections. So it's a very unfortunate situation. So that, so that without question, in, in answer to Time Magazine's question, AIDS is not cured, and the epidemic is far from over in the US. Now, globally, as I'm sure you know, the situation is truly dire, truly dire. So that HIV infection globally is now more common than we first thought. And there are over 40 million um, individuals as of last year that are HIV infected in the world. Question? Um, going back to the, the looking at the teenager part. Yes. right across the board. Because Urban schools, rural schools, I mean, the, uh, sort, of, sort of the full gamut. Right. 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 So yes, I mean, uh, so with this survey, it was done by the Gallup poll, and they tried to do it across sort of a broad cross-section of high schools. So yes. So globally, then, greater than 40 million individuals are now HIV infected. They're being infected at a rate um, of roughly 14,000 a day, because roughly 5 million new infections are thought to have happened last year. What's interesting, however, is that if you look at those daily numbers, 14,000 a day, and you break them down, what's interesting is that of the 14,000, 2,000 are in children younger than 15 years old. 12,000, the remaining 12,000 are in the age range of 15 to 49 years old. So that what is interesting is that HIV is hitting globally, if you will, that portion of society that ultimately supports the economy and the overall social structure of society, young working adults, if you will. The fact that so many children are being infected, unfortunately, underscores if you will, the role that children globally often play in the sex industry, for example, and sort of a systemic structure of child abuse, of sexual child abuse, you know, that, that exists in some cultures and in some countries. Um, of the 12,000 that are older than 15 years old, half of them are women. And half of them are even in that particularly young age range of 15 to 24 years old. So really what we're looking at is an infection of an especially critical segment of society. <laughs>
At this point, it's thought that globally, conservatively, 1% of the sexually active um, adults in the world are infected. Nora? Um, who, is, who is keeping track of this? Like, where is this data from? Right, so, so all, of, all of this data is from the World Health Organization. Okay. Yes, yes. So in fact, there's, a, there's also a convergent organization called UNAIDS, which also works with the World Health, Health Organization to, to um, track these numbers and do these estimates. Did you happen to see in, I don't know, maybe three months ago in time, they actually mapped the sexual um, relationships of high school teens? Mm -hmm. it was yes. And th that mixed with what you're saying here freaks me out. Yes, I saw that. Because, I mean, the level of sexual activity, the complexity of it, the time of coital debut, yes, is, is, is really, really remarkable. And um, what's also interesting is that by current estimates, nine out of ten individuals in the world that are infected don't know it. Just based on how new infections are uncovered, they do not have a pre-existing awareness that they may be at risk, which of course is a major problem. And last year, more than three million individuals died um, from AIDS, globally. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it does. Yes. Question? Is that like the eleventh cause of death or something like that? Where is it ranked in the causes of death globally? Oh, globally, it's now, no, no, it's much higher than that. It's in the top three. Okay. So yeah. It's number one in Africa. Right, right. Globally. Right, globally, it's so in the top three now. Three yes. Like that. And that's beating heart disease, cancer, and stroke and all that? Too? Um, it's not beating heart, heart disease, it's beat cancer. Yes, oh, yes, yes. Is it beat malaria? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Hands down. Hands down. Okay. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the number of individuals that have died in comparison to the mid to late 90s, that's a 60% higher figure. So that one thing to keep in mind is that for these 40, greater than 40 million individuals globally, they will die from this disease. And so, you know, that is an, an enormous number of deaths that's coming down the pike. What's interesting as well is that of the deaths, greater than a third were adult women. And what is quite clear is that women are particularly at risk globally for contracting HIV. The risk of transmission for women is much higher than for men. Just uh, and biologically, based on the target cells which are present in the, in the female reproductive tract, the risk is significantly higher, at least five-fold higher for women. Now, of course, this looks very serious, but if you, oh yes, something else I should say is that about a fifth were under 15 years old. Um, that what's, died. What's the breakdown on that for the sort of the early teenager who's involved in the sex industry compared to children who are born with HIV? I would say the sex industry probably accounts for at least 75 percent. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Unfortunately, the sex industry globally is growing enormously. The, uh, the internet has not helped. Um, and so, for example, the sex industry has been a key part of HIV infection in parts of Africa, in India, for example, in Thailand. What is interesting is that it's becoming an increasingly major component of transmission in, for example, um, former members of the Soviet Republic. Eastern Europe has become extremely important as a site for the sex industry, for pornography, so on and so forth. So that is having an impact on transmission as well. Now, if you look at how the numbers break down, in terms of those that are HIV infected, what's quite clear is that sub-Saharan Africa bears the lion's share, over 25 million 
HIV-infected individuals are currently in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. There's the million in, in North America. What is quite interesting, however, is that we are seeing significant increases in some key parts of the world. For example, the number of infections in Latin America is going up. The number of infections in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and also in East Asia, are increasing significantly. So for example, China is seeing a significant increase in the rate of new infections, in part due to the emergence of a booming drug industry on the coast of China. In terms of Eastern Europe, as I said, both, if you will, the um, drug world as well as the sex industry are having a dramatic impact, and the convergence of the two actually, are having a dramatic impact on Eastern Europe. And so there's a real concern that unless something is done, for example, in this part of the world to contain what's happening, the current prediction is that India alone, India, uh, so yeah, let me make sure I have this right. The current projection from the World Health Organization is that if something is not done about the rate of new infections in India, India alone by 2012 will have this number of HIV-infected individuals, India alone. And so there's a real pressure to try and contain what's happening here to avoid what's happened in Africa. Question? Does that have anything to do with education and knowledge? Significantly. Um, let's, look at some of the numbers that are on the, on the board. Well, it, well, it's not strictly education. There's also some cultural issues, which we'll see soon, that do feed into um, this process. But like, for example, in India, for well over 10 years, the government completely turned its back on HIV and AIDS. India is an interesting case, because India has an enormous sex industry that is completely illegal, but the government ignores it. So for example, one of the first physicians in Bombay that was handing out free condoms was arrested for doing so because he was arrested and then the, the thought was that that was an obscene act, if you will. So India is a remarkably conservative society, but at the same time has this booming sex industry and this galloping HIV epidemic. Compounding that, you have the problem of extreme poverty. You also have the problem of an, of an extremely complex language sort of scenario. So even in terms of education, what language do you educate in? There are hundreds of different dialects. It, in India. So, I mean, I could spend the whole morning talking about India because there is, there's a whole complex sort of range of issues that really tie into why containing the epidemic is so difficult in that country. How are the numbers, um, I'm not well versed in the population of the different areas, how are the numbers compared in terms of the world population in specific areas? Like, when you compare the number of right. to the population, right. is <clears throat> sub Saharan still highest in terms of concentration? Absolutely, yes. So in terms of the percentage, and we'll see that shortly, okay. the percentage of infected is very high. I mean, it's very high. With India, the percentage is much lower, but they, that country alone has over a billion people. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why India is of such concern, because that's a population concentration that's so high that unless it's contained, it will just gallop out of control. <clears throat> so in the case of Africa, though, it's obviously a very, very serious problem in terms of global health. And so at this point, it's, it's estimated that in sub-Saharan Africa, all of sub-Saharan Africa, 8%, actually it's now currently closer to 10% of 15 to 49-year-old um, adults are infected. And that's the entire population of sub-Saharan Africa. So it's close to 1 in 10. So that if this were a class in that was represented of sub-Saharan Africa, I'm about two of you, would be HIV infected. However, if we get sort of a little bit more granular, in countries like Botswana, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and Swaziland, 25 to 30 percent of this age group are infected. In fact, it's Bot in Botswana, it's more like 35 percent. In large towns in Zimbabwe, 70% of the pregnant women that come in for free health care are HIV infected. And when you say adults, do you mean the 15 to 49? 49, yes. Mm -hmm. 
So that here we have a scenario where the degree, the percentage of HIV infected adults in the population is enormously high. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if this class you know, was in Zimbabwe, imagine over a third of you would be HIV infected. And so what you have are countries that are going to be um, devastated and are already being devastated by, by the epidemic. Uh, to some degree, uh, in terms of the Christian missionaries that work in the field, they really tend to not address it very much. Um, the Islamic missionaries do not address it at all. I mean, I mean, Islam definitely does not want to talk about HIV and AIDS, period. Um, and so that's a little bit of a problem as well. Um, so what's interesting, however, is if you look at the causes of deaths globally and in Africa, uh, as you can see, with lung cancer, it's not a significant cause of death in Africa, 0.3 of a percent. But uh, in terms of TB, you can see that it's 2.2 percent in Africa versus 2.8 percent um, globally. But in terms of HIV and AIDS, it's now actually it's now over 22 percent in terms of a cause of death, just period, in sub-Saharan Africa. So that clearly, um, Africa is being um, decimated by the disease. Perhaps a very sad sort of diagram is looking at the impact HIV and AIDS has had on life expectancy in selected African countries. And what you can see is, you know, taking the example of Botswana, what it has done is it has returned the life expectancy gains due to, of course, Im improvements in health care back to the level that was associated with the mid to late 60s. So it has reversed three to four decades of economic progress in terms of life expectancy. Um, Uganda is showing a little blip upward. Now, I remember yes. hearing that yes. they have a, a public health program that has been... Yes, Uganda is in... Yes, Uganda is sort of the model system in Africa of how a government has responded appropriately and has actually made a difference in terms of the course of the epidemic. Unfortunately, with countries like um, Zimbabwe, like um, South Africa, they're not exactly replicating the example of Uganda. But yes, Uganda is a success story on the continent. There's no question about that. Um, I mean, I think that government leadership in general is, uh, of course, absolutely crucial. Um, South Africa is a very interesting case because with South Africa, um, Mbeke, the president of South Africa, has perhaps understandably a chip on his shoulder vis-a-vis -vis the West. And one of the sort of difficult things is that Mbeke, unfortunately, aligned himself with sort of a radical fringe group that argues that HIV does not cause AIDS. So the consequence is that South Africa that has a seroprevalence approaching 37%, 37% is a country where Mbeke blocked um, a program that would have distributed AZT to pregnant women. And it's clear that AZT treatment during pregnancy reduces the risk of transmission to the newborn infant by more than half. So, I mean, that's absolutely clear. But Mbeke made the argument, well, he was convinced that, well, a a HIV doesn't really cause AIDS. But the, the argument that he has also made is that, well, the problem is not HIV and AIDS. The problem is sort of, sort of 
the economic consequences of colonialism and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Now, to sort of go in at a little bit higher resolution, here's something that may address some of the issues. Um, in terms of how this might be happening and culturally why things might happen the way they do. So we're looking at the prevalence rate among teenagers in Kisumu, Kenya by age, looking at boys and girls. What you can see is that by 15 years of age, 8.3 of the young women are infected. By 16, 18% of the young women are infected. Note, no men, no boys are infected. No, no, no. I mean, these are these. This is a snapshot at once. Okay. Right. Um, so they're not being followed over time. Okay. Um, so 17, in terms of 17-year-olds, you start to see some infection in, in young men. We're up to about 30% in young women. It's not clear why there's a blip down. I think I think this has something to do with the number of 18-year-olds. But what you can see is that by 19, you can see that a third of the young women in Kisumu are infected. Are they dying, maybe? Is that why? It's no, 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 that? no. I think it has to do with, since this is a snapshot at one point, in terms of the number of 18-year-olds um, of that they pulled into the study, I think that was lower. But what, but what you can see, there's a very striking trend up that starts at a significantly younger age for women. And what's interesting, what this study has shown, is that there's a cultural issue here that helps to, to drive this, which is that in Kenya, many young women, the only way in which they, aff they can afford to go to high school, because this was actually in high school, so these are young folks in high school, the only way they can afford to go to high school and get money for the uniforms and for books is to be, quote unquote, sponsored by an older man. It's very traditional that high school girls are sponsored by men older than 35 years old. And of course, in exchange for the sponsorship, their sexual favors. So that there is a connection between sex with significantly older men and these young girls. Um, and so what happens is you're seeing the transfer of infection from those older men that also go to sex workers, so on and so forth, to their young charges that they're sponsoring in high school. So this is sort of a socio-economic cultural phenomenon that um, unfortunately has a dramatic impact on the inroad of infections into a younger um, population. Um, just a, a random question. Have there been any studies of um, the differences between sort of societies where this is common and societies where the chastity of young girls is the most important thing. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe maybe this is you know no longer such a such a big deal. But you know, I, I mean, you, know, you hear about societies where, um, you know, like maybe India, for example. I know where if if there's a doubt at uh, a young woman's virginity, you know, there's no one will have her in that kind of thing. Right, right. Well, India is an interesting case with this because um, it's a it, culturally it's so it's such a complex sort of situation. You're quite right. In India, there is openly an emphasis on the chastity of the woman. But in India, there is n almost no restrictions on the behavior of the man. And in fact, one of the interesting things about the epidemic in India is that the seroprevalence among monogamous married women in, I believe, Madras is very similar to the Sarah prevalence among sex workers in New York City. And the reason being, quite simply, is that the women are monogamous, the husbands are not. And so there is a remarkable infiltration <laughs> of... <laughs> there is an alarming infiltration of the virus into what should be a low risk low seroprevalence group of individuals. Um, now, in very strict societies, like in the Middle East, seroprevalence is very poor, uh, is, is, is very low. 
But India is very complicated because, well, as you know, there's this whole, uh, yes, yes, because I mean, there's this whole issue of the burning of wives and that, that kind of thing. So anyway, we all have, have heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm seeing something on TV. Um, it had to do with Africa again, and it had to do with men wanting virgins. Uh. Yes. Afraid of getting the yes. So that's why it goes younger and younger and younger. Right. And, and right. Yes. The kids, the girls are getting very, very young. Yes. Yes. So that men, and especially older men, do want increasingly younger, younger women as brides, but also as prostitutes as well. So in other words, if you're going to sex, you know, to a sex worker, you want one that's extremely young. So that has really driven the um, child prostitution sort of expansion significantly. So, what is interesting is that no pathogen has received the attention or the amount of research of HIV. We're more than two decades into the research on this virus with an unprecedented level of funding. But what is frustrating is that even after over 20 years of research, much of what we took for granted in terms of how the virus works has in fact been proven wrong. So that even today, we continually revise our understanding of how HIV interacts with the human body, even how, tr how transmission occurs. And so that is something that is sort of very striking about this. And this, as I said before, is despite what truly is the most concerted effort of medical research in modern history. Really, it's each year more than 17,000 primary literature articles are published on HIV alone. But still, we are, there's still much that we are trying to understand um, about this virus. So in terms of some of the things that were proven wrong, in 1984, it was shown that the receptor for HIV is a cell surface molecule called CD4, which is found on T helper cells. From essentially 1984 to 1996, the dogma was that CD4 is the receptor for HIV, that's how we can understand which cells are susceptible to the virus. In fact, that is not, strictly speaking, correct in that CD4 infection, infection via CD4 requires another receptor called a co-receptor that really helps us understand how certain cells are susceptible to particular strains of virus versus others. That did not actually emerge until 1996, 1997. The idea of viral dormancy is another one that has been proven to be quite incorrect. Early on, it was thought that AIDS lasts for so long because the virus infects cells and then goes dormant. There's a latency to it. That happens in a very small subset of cells. And that, in fact, during the course of AIDS, or during, if you will, the latent period where you're not showing symptoms, the virus is replicating like gangbusters and in fact, there's a pitched battle in between your immune system and the virus during those years. So viral dormancy is a rare phenomenon. And as I said before, the fact that combination therapy is a potential cure or long-term therapy has now been proven wrong. That the virus is so mutable that it will in fact um, acquire resistance or evolve resistance to combination therapy after four years. Question. There's a segment um, in a series of videos that talks about the HIV virus and how you know, it's used to study evolution and change and so forth. But one yes. of the things that comes up is the idea that if you move someone from combination therapy, the virus sort of heads back to the previous form. Is that something that's old, like like old fact that isn't really useful anymore, or something that's still being used? Or? Um, oh, so, oh so, this, so the notion is that you you reset it and then you restart therapy. Yeah, you restart yes. Therapy. yes, yes, yes. So, well, it's a tricky thing. So what you are referring to is what's called a treatment holiday. Right. So the notion is that if, you, if you're on therapy and then you stop therapy, you give the virus a chance to re-emerge and, and sort of quasi and diversify, and then you hit it with therapy again and kill off all of those versions. It's a high risk approach because in roughly a third of patients that take a holiday, mm -hmm. they can't get the virus back under control. Because the problem is, so let's say you're on therapy 
you have a diversified um, population of a score of different strains in your body. You don't know if there is some small group in there that in fact is highly resistant. When you stop the therapy, that number expands quite nicely. Then you restart therapy, you can't get that subset back under control. It's very risky. And in fact, personally, I feel that stopping therapy, well, not only is it high risk, but I think it also represents a major problem in that you increase the risk of resistance emerging. And so, for example, you know, this is a digression, but it's an interesting one. Doctors Without Borders, two years ago, launched a wonderful new program to make um, antiretroviral drugs available to over 12,000 patients globally. Great. Using sort of a generic combination that they have um, made in Brazil. It's a wonderful program. It's made a great difference in the lives of these 12 to 14,000 patients. When a colleague of mine who's part of, of Doctors Without Borders told me about this, I thought it was a wonderful idea. I was very concerned about it because the theory behind this program is to shame pharmaceutical in, um, companies into relaxing the patent laws. In other words, Doctors Without Borders, their goal is to show the effect that this therapy can have on a large number of patients globally, how cheap the therapy is, which costs about a dollar a day, um, and to shame the pharmaceutical companies and world governments into doing something about it. The comment I made to my colleague is, you're always playing a dangerous game of chicken when you think you can shame a government or a big pharmaceutical company. They're remarkably immune to shame. <coughs> remarkably immune. And my concern is they run out of drugs in roughly a year from now. When those drugs run out, you're going to have 14,000 patients that will go off therapy. The consequence is, consequence is that you're going to see an emergence of resistant strains. They will be passing on resistant strains. So if the world governments and the pharmaceutical companies don't blink in this game of chicken, we're going to have an epidemiological crisis, in particular in countries like Brazil and Guatemala, where the bulk of these patients now reside. So I'm very concerned about it. I mean, I admire the goal. I think the method is unwise. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's really extremely risky. Um, so in any case, much of what we thought has been proven wrong. Are you sharing your concerns with us? Yes, yes. But the, the, the whole thing launched, however. I mean, they're very, they're a great group, but they're very political. And so it's, you know, this is our political statement, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, but their hope is that they will that something will happen in the next year. It might, which would be great. I'm not totally convinced that will be the case. Now, even if we think about the success in terms of therapy, here's an interesting diagram to look at, which is probably hard, hard for you to read. What you're seeing in black are in different areas of the world, from North Africa and the Middle East to high-income countries, such as the US to Asia, in black, you're looking at the number of people using the antiretroviral drugs. And in mustard, you're looking at the number of HIV AIDS deaths. So look at the ratio, for example, in the high-income high countries. There are the number of people using the drugs. There are the number of deaths. Look at Africa. Here are the number of people using drugs. And here we see the number of deaths. And so what you can see, and this is something I underscore to students all the time, a cure is only a cure if you can get it. So even when combination therapy was still thought of as the most fabulous thing since sliced bread, none of these people were getting it. And so what's the point of a cure if combination therapy costs somewhere between ten to $35,000 a year? even $10,000 a year is completely out of reach for the majority of individuals in the developing world. While the therapy that Doctors Without Borders is using costs around 330 a year. So 330 versus I think the equivalent from Glaxo Welcome is, I mean from GlaxoSmithKline is on the order of I think 18,000. 
or 25,000 a year. You have a question? Um, the drugs that they take, is that, that's lifelong, right? You'd have to take a, or do they, hmm? the drugs they would take for AIDS is lifelong. Yes, so yes, yes, there is no cure. People in Africa, times the number of years that they would live in order to have that drug, you'd have to have an incredible amount of it. Yes. To be able to support all that. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, but since you have raised that point in terms of, since we're thinking about how to get Africa the drugs, there's another amazing biological thing to keep in mind. Um, as you all know, with the Human Genome Project, there's, an, and I know I'm digressing, but this is sort of informal anyway. Um, with the Human Genome Project, there's been an increasing emphasis on what's called um, single nucleotide and polymorphism analysis, SNP analysis. So these are single nucleotide changes or variations in genes. <coughs> so that as you know, a SNP can be associated with a particular alteration in the activity of the gene product. And in fact, it's quite likely that not too long from now, every time we go and see our doctor, he or she will do a SNP profile of us, and they'll be able to predict our propensity for colon cancer, for breast cancer in women, for Alzheimer's perhaps, ultimately perhaps for alcoholism, schizophrenia, a whole host of different sort of syndromes. There's one SNP that has been identified in a gene called MDR1. And this SNP is associated, was associated initially with resistance to, to anti-cancer drugs. So if you have one copy of the SNP, you actually are more likely to resist chemotherapy than if you have another copy. The reason being that MDR1 is a, is a membrane pump that actually pumps drug components out of the cell. So the more MDR1 you have, the more drug you'll pump out of the cell, which is, of course, you want the drug in the cell. So you need to add more drug to get the appropriate concentration inside the cell. So this was first observed for anti-cancer drugs. Unfortunately, many of the antiretrovirals have the same chemical structure or related chemical structure to anti-cancer drugs. So MDR1 has that impact on the combination therapy drugs as well. <coughs> What's interesting, the prevalence <coughs> of the SNP that results in the enhanced pumping of the, of the anti-HIV drug is 10 times higher <coughs> in sub-Saharan Africa than it is, for example, in the US. So that many Africans require a higher dose of the anti-HIV drugs than do, for example, um, Caucasians in the US. So not only do you have access problems, not only do you have the affordability problems, you're going to need more of it per individual as well. And so it's a really unfortunate convergence. Yes. yes, that is a serious concern. And in fact, it hasn't been so much of an issue in Africa because so few people have access to drugs. But in the US, the acquisition of um, a virus that is already resistant to combination therapy is a reality. So in other words, you know, I talked about the salvage therapy. You know, one might argue, OK, so, you, so you're infected. You have four years on combination therapy. Then we have a new salvage therapy that may buy you another three or four years, so on and so forth. The problem is if you acquire a virus that is already resistant to combination therapy, which is happening increasingly frequently, you lose those four years from the get-go. So you have to start with salvage immediately. And so that is a problem, which is why, for example, the issue of containing transmission at the same time that you have therapy is is of critical importance. And, and even if the drug companies aren't very subject to shame, there's no guarantee that they can keep coming up with Solid new, new innovation. Yeah. So, uh, and what they do come up with, it seems that it's often <coughs> just variants without really being always very new breakthroughs. Yes, yes. 
that's quite true. And in fact, there have been some new breakthroughs in terms of which steps of the viral replication cycle to target. But um, what has happened is that even those variants, eventually resistance occurs. The virus is so mutable and so plastic. I mean, you have to realize that you're infected with one strain. By six months, you can have as many as 12 to 15 different strains, dominant strains in your body. I mean, in some ways, for biologists that are interested in, in the study of evolution, in the body of a single AIDS patient, you have an accelerated time scale of evolution in just the body of one person. Is there a critical mutation that makes it no longer an AIDS virus? Like it mutates so much, yes. it makes it no longer an AIDS virus. Yes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the, inter the interesting thing is that the majority of these mutations are negative for the virus. Most of them are. I mean, it's random, like any other kind of, uh, of mutation. What is remarkable is that there's so much virus that you so, so roughly 1 in 10,000 um, variants in your body are infectious. But you get billions of new variants per day. So, so that's the... That's the problem. <laughs> oh, you mean? In, so, in other words, if we were if we were to introduce into someone a um, a defective virus, yeah. um, no, because I mean, you, you need to establish the infection you know, to then see the, see the propagation of other strains. So if it can't infect or replicate, it's a dud, essentially. Um, so what we're looking at here is a, is, a, is a transmission electron micrograph of the virion budding from the surface, in this case, of a macrophage. What is remarkable is that the virus is a relatively simple structure. So that, in fact, here we have a diagram of the structure of, of the virus. And what you can see is that it has sort of three layers to it, if you will. You have the outer um, phospholipid bilayer envelope. And studying in the envelope are some critical proteins from the virus, in particular GP41, which is the transmembrane protein, and, um, and GP120 which is, in fact, the critical viral protein that allows it to recognize and infect specific cells. Inside the virus, going one layer in, you have what's called the viral matrix, which gives the virus, if you will, its three-dimensional structure and also stabilizes it, makes it structurally robust. And then at the very inside of the virus, you have the viral core, which is, in fact, houses the viral genome, which consists of two strands of RNA, and a host of other viral enzymes, which include reverse transcriptase, which copies viral RNA into cDNA, and also an enzyme called integrase, which is important for integrating the um, viral cDNA into the genome of the infected cell. We used to have a pointer in this room, but, oh, there it is. So what I'm going to do is just sort of quickly lead you through the viral life cycle. And then in particular, we're going to talk about some of these components that have particular bearing on neuropathologies in terms of the killing of neurons. But first, let's start off with what the life cycle of the virus looks like. So what we know is that for most cells, HIV needs to interact with two um, critical cell surface components. CD4 sort of remains the primary receptor for the virus, but then there's another receptor called the, called the co-receptor, of which perhaps the most ex important example is a co-receptor named um, CCR5. The critical interaction between GP120 on the surface of the virus and these two cell surface receptors actually allows the fusion of the viral envelope with the phospholipid bilayer or plasma membrane of the host cell. This allows the viral core to enter the cytoplasm of the cell. Once inside the cytoplasm, 
you get the reverse transcription of viral RNA, which of course is single-stranded, into double-stranded viral cDNA. This viral cDNA, in conjunction with some other viral proteins, is imported into the nucleus of the targeted cell, and it integrates into the genome. So that essentially, the so-called provirus, as it is now called once it's integrated, is indistinguishable from the genome of the host cell. So what's interesting, as you know, viruses are essentially non-living entities. By themselves, they have no means of replication. They have no means of harnessing energy, no means of, um, of making proteins, for example. So they require the machinery of the cell to do all that. So of course, what better way to harness the machinery of the cell than to become part of the genome of the infected cell? So that this critical proviral integration event is one of the first steps in truly co-opting the function of the infected cell or the activities of the infected cell. What then happens next is that the provirus utilizes host cell transcription factors. RNAs are made, they are spliced, and a variety of viral proteins are manufactured in the cytoplasm. These viral proteins, which include enzymes like reverse transcriptase, they also include, for example, structural proteins that make up the matrix of the virus. All of these components together with full-length viral RNA become packaged with parts of the cell's plasma membrane to form and to bud and form new virions. So that quite literally, the virus overtakes all of the, if you will, central dogma machinery of the cell to manufacture new variants. In terms of the fate of the cell, this budding of new variants will eventually kill the cell. But there are also a variety of toxic events involving some of these same viral proteins that also kill the cell. And this has some bearing specifically on neurons. So what we're looking at here is, let's say, the canonical situation with a CD4 cell or a T4 cell in the immune system. But HIV can have a dramatic impact on a variety of other cells. So that if we look at the clinical course of HIV infection, what's interesting is that here we see in the open circles is amviremia, the amount of virus in the blood. What you can see is that basically within the first three to six weeks, there's an enormous spike of virus um, that you can see in the bloodstream. At the same time, there's a dramatic fall in the number of CD4 cells. So that HIV has a very dramatic effect on killing CD4 cells very early on. Then there is a gradual, reproducibly partial recovery of CD4, and there is usually a dramatic fall off in viremia. Then for a number of years, you have what might seem like relatively low viremia. This low viremia is not due to the virus going dormant, as, as was once thought. It's due to your immune system combating the virus over those six or seven years. This is a war that your immune system gradually loses, which is why you see that even though you have this weak recovery in the first year, gradually over time, and this is a clinical hallmark of AIDS, your CD4 cell numbers um, decline over the years. Once they drop below a critical threshold of roughly 200, what you see is that viremia returns, you absolutely lose control over viral replication, and this is when you get the emergence 
of constitutional symptoms and opportunistic infections associated with AIDS. But classically, the emphasis has been on how the virus kills these CD4 cells, which is a critical part of how the immune system collapses. But what's interesting is that at around this time period as well, by eight or nine years of infection, you start to see the emergence of neuropathologies as well. So you start to see the emergence of what's called AIDS-related uh, um, dementia. And so what you see is, of course, a decline in cognitive function. And you start to see symptoms in terms of, of impaired cognitive function that are not that different from Alzheimer's, for example. Question? Is this particular um, cor clinical course with or without the use of drugs? Without the use of drugs. So with the use of drugs, it might extend that? By four years, six years? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this region here will expand, for example, with combination therapy by another three or four years, at least. Yeah. Tuberculosis has been increasing because of AIDS. Is that correct? Because of the opportunistic diseases coming? Um, um, to some that? degree. To some degree. I mean, TB is, is exacerbated by HIV infection. But it is somewhat an independent disease, it, sort of in and of itself as well. Nor? Um, you keep saying that the combination therapy starts to fall apart after three, four, five years. Yeah. I'm not really sure of the time frame, but haven't a lot of people in the USA been on those therapies for about that length of time, and what's happening to them? Well, so now they're, they're moving on to salvage therapy. Okay. So at this point, we have about two rounds of salvage that look decent. Um, there's a different set of reverse transcriptase inhibitors that buy you, on average, another two or three years. Then on top of it, what was approved last year is a new drug called infertivide, which hits a completely different part. It actually blocks the fusion of the virus with the cell. And at this point, that may buy you another two or three years as well. So we're sort of in this game of, of trying to extend and extend and extend. Is there a subset of people that never develop AIDS because of some cellular, I would say, a cellular um, difference. advantage that maybe we haven't identified? Like, I always think of Magic Johnson. We always go yes. back to when he was identified because that was such a major. Yes. And he was the, the athlete. That right. Was, though, uh, though Magic Johnson also has access to remarkable correct, experimental right, therapy. High income, yeah. obviously. Yes, but, yes. Um, there has to, I, I believe there's got to be an evolutionary advantage that somebody, some people have an advantage due to some cellular difference. Absolutely. And in fact, it's thought that among Caucasian Americans, roughly 2% are able to either resist being infected or they're able to live with the infection. These are individuals called long-term non-progressors. There's a variety of reasons why they seem to have this ability. One of them is that some of them have a mutation in the core receptor that prevents, yes, that prevents HIV. Actually, they don't have the core receptor expressed. And so that um, actually prevents the high efficiency infection by the virus. So that's only about 2% of the population, however. And one thing to keep in mind, I mean, you raised an interesting point about sort of the evolution. Um, uh, do any of you know where HIV came from? Some of you know? So, so it came from Africa. It was, it's interesting because three or four years ago, we actually wouldn't know for sure. It is a chimpanzee virus. Yes. So it's, um, it's a chimpanzee virus. And as far as we can tell, in the particular species of chimp that it infects, it has no negative effect. So in fact, it's thought that the virus has been in chimps for thousands of years and that they have evolved this sort of mutually advantageous relationship. Um, and what perhaps is alarming about that is that we have a pathogen that for thousands of years has evolved the relationship with a primate immune system. Unfortunately, it wasn't our immune system. So if HIV infection goes on for another thousand years, we probably will have evolved 
that sort of relationship, the problem is the cost, the toll, will be far too high. I guess I just wonder if it's been introduced in people previous to most recent introduction that just like people may have either died out or whatever happened yes. along the way. Yes, that's quite likely. It's quite likely that the jump from chimps to humans has been happening for, for hundreds of years probably, but that because of the isolation of, of rural towns in Africa, the lack of transport sort of back and forth, but also perhaps less exposure to these chimps. Because another problem is, have you heard of, um, of um, the term um, bushmeat? One of the problems is that with highways being built through the jungle, these chimps have become a source of high, prote of high quality protein. So they're being hunted and killed and eaten. Um, and the problem is with the hunting and the butchering of the chimpanzees, that's a place where trans transmission of the virus from chimps to humans is taking place at much higher frequency. Of course, a major concern is that we haven't seen all the simian viruses that these chimps have to offer. And that is it possible that there's another virus that is even more deadly than HIV that may eventually move into humans as well. So there's been a real sort of push to end the bushmeat trade. But in, in countries like um, Gabon, where you're under the influence of grinding poverty, any high quality protein source is an important one. As far as we know, yes. No. Um, the virus in South America is clearly from the US. Yeah, yeah. So, one thing that I sort of alluded to is that the dynamics of CD4 cell numbers during HIV, HIV disease is a little bit different than what we had first thought, in that, as I said before, there are very high rates of HIV replication so that there's no dormancy. But what's interesting is that there's also an equally high rate of CD4 cell turnover in HIV positive patients. So in other words, not only are, is there a huge production of new virus, there's of necessity a regeneration of new CD4 cells that's much more significant and robust than we first thought. So that by current estimates, every day in the life of a patient, 100 billion new HIV variants are generated per day. And that at the same time, almost 2 billion CD4 cells are killed and replaced each day. <laughs> right, so that what... Right, so what this represents in terms of numbers is you're looking at about 5% of your CD4 cells, 5 to 10%. So that what happens here <clears throat> is that there's a remarkably intense pitched battle for all those years in between your immune system and the virus, and that there's an enormous number of new virus particles being generated every day. So that in fact what happens in the course of AIDS is the gradual collapse of your immune system because your immune system cannot continue regenerating that many new CD4 cells each and every day. In fact, it was a major breakthrough in, in immunology to even realize that we could do this. In other words, the regenerative capacity for CD4 cells was never thought to be that high. So, so this is sort of a real change in how we view, view the immune system. But clearly then, HIV is remarkably active in the body. And so, <laughs> here towards the end of the talk, let's get into this issue of neurons, specifically. And so, one thing that's interesting about the virus is that clearly CD4 is the primary receptor for the virus. But interestingly enough, there are a variety of alternative receptors that are CD4 independent. So what is disturbing is that not only does HIV infect cells with CD4, it can also colonize other cells that don't have CD4 at all. 
So that what had been noted for a number of years is that so-called CD4 negative, CD4 minus cells can be infected by HIV. One prime example are, of course, the epithelial cells of the bowel can be infected by HIV even though they do not express CD4 in any manner. But in terms of our interest in neuroscience, what you'll be interested in knowing is that there are, in fact, subsets of neurons that can be directly infected by HIV, even though they do not express um, CD4, of course. And that in infection phenomenon is perhaps due to an alternative receptor by the name of GAL-C, or, or galactosyl ceramide. Now, GAL-C is not even a protein. It is, of course, a lipid that's modified with carbohydrates. And what's interesting about GAL-C is that it appears to cluster very specifically with other glycolipids. And it appears to be a critical player in an interesting cell surface phenomenon called lipid rafts where, in fact, specific populations of glycolipids, of phospholipids, of sphingolipids come together into rafts, sort of specialized domains in the membrane. And that in CD4 cells, GAL-C actually clusters with CD4, interestingly enough. But neurons do not have CD4. But what's been observed is that HIV productively infects a variety of cultured neuronal cell lines. And the culprit that allows this appears to be GAL-C, in that if you expose these cell lines to anti-GAL-C antibodies, they block the infection of these CD4 minus cell lines. So, in fact, two neuronal cell lines are known to be HIV sensitive. And what's interesting is that you can observe the accumulation of HIV on the surface of these cells, but fusion fails. So that this has been observed, it's not well understood how the virus is utilizing this glycolipid, but it does appear as if neurons can be infected by HIV via this alternative route. And thus you can get a contribution to neuronal cell death directly from viral infection. There is another phenomenon that has bearing on how HIV can gain access to neurons, which normally you would think would not be I'm susceptible to HIV. And that's the formation of what are called pseudotype viruses. Have any, have any of you ever heard of this term? It's a very interesting term, and it really underscores some interesting characteristics of many viruses. So a pseudotype is in fact a chimeric virus. It's a virus where one viral genome is encapsulated within a different viral envelope. Aren't they trying to use that in some uh, therapies to try to Yes, reduce, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So it has been used both therapeutically and uh, as a research tool as well. But you could think of it as a little bit like a Trojan horse virus in some ways. And in vitro, you can actually create pseudotypes by co-infecting cells with two different viruses. So that if a cell is co-infected with two viruses, it can produce chimeric um, pseudotypes over time. 
So in the case of HIV, HIV can form pseudotypes in between the two types of HIV. As you probably know, there's HIV-1 and HIV-2. You can get a mixture of those two. HIV-1 will form a pseudotype with HTLV-1, human, human T-cell leukemia virus, which is another human virus um, that attacks T-cells. It causes leukemia. <coughs> HIV will also form pseudotypes in vitro with even mouse retroviruses, murine retroviruses. Do this? Yeah. Well, in terms of a research setting, pseudotypes are useful because they allow you to introduce HIV to a cell that would normally not be susceptible to HIV, which is, of course, the punchline of this whole story. Because, in fact, another pseudotype that can be formed is with, her is with herpes viruses, such as herpes simplex virus. So let's look at what a pseudotype might look like. So let's say here we have HIV, the HIV core with the HIV envelope. And here we have HSV, the HSV core with the, HI, with the HSV envelope. Now, if a cell receives both of these viruses, so this is the co-infection event, that we talked about. This single cell can actually produce more HIV, as you would expect, more HSV, herpes simplex virus, as you, as you would expect. But it also produces viruses that have the HIV envelope, but with the HSV genome. And most importantly, the HSV envelope with the HIV genome. So does this happen on its own, or do you have to yes. add some chemical? Just no, no, this is entirely accidental. Okay. As the budding process takes place, what happens is, as an HIV envelope buds, it captures an HSV core by mistake. Okay. So these are the two pseudotypes. And as many of you know, herpes viruses do infect neurons. So in fact, this is another way in which HIV can gain access to neuronal cells. The syringa in vitro, is it observed also in vivo? Or yes. Yes. So for example, this, for, so for some time, pseudotypes were only seen in vitro. What has now been clearly demonstrated, for example, particularly with HSV, is that HSV pseudotypes have been isolated from the oral cavities of, of co-infected AIDS patients. So it is seen in vivo now. And in fact, some of the peripheral neuropathies that have been observed in individuals that have very active HSV infections and are also HIV infected are thought to be due to these pseudotypes actually infecting and destroying neurons that they normally wouldn't have access to. So clearly, this is yet another means by which HIV can access um, um, neuronal cells. Finally, HIV can have direct toxic effects on neurons, but specifically not due to the infection event but due to HIV proteins. And in fact, I've basically run out of time, but this is what I'm going to sort of leave you with. If you remember, the virus has GP41 inserted in the viral envelope and GP120, so it studs the surface of the virus. GP120 is non-covalently attached to GP41. So that, and I know this is Ray's favorite phrase, <laughs> so that as the virus tumbles through the bloodstream, it actually sheds GP120, like a hairy dog shedding fur in the summer. Um, 
So that free GP120 is a real problem in the body of infected individuals. Now, why is free GP120 a problem? Because if you expose neurons in culture to free GP120, they kill themselves. They undergo programmed cell death. They undergo what's called um, apoptosis. Now, the reason why this happens is because these neurons, when they're exposed to GP120, experience a massive influx of calcium. This huge influx of calcium, which is sustained, is inappropriate. Neurons are exquisitely calibrated such that if there's too much calcium, they think something's wrong and they kill themselves. It's a way to preserve the integrity of a neuronal network in some ways. Because as you know, br a brief influx of calcium is a critical part of neurotransmission. It's what neurotransmitters do in many cases. They open calcium channels transiently. Now believe it or not, what's now been shown is that GP120 binds to neuronal calcium channels and blocks them open. So it results in this sustained flood of calcium and there's neuronal cell death. So what is interesting is that GP120 actually accumulates in the body over time. And that as it does that over time, free GP120, as it does that over time, you start to see increasing neuronal apoptosis, both in the, both in the periphery and in the central nervous system, Equal. due to GP120. Equal. It attacks the nervous system yes. equally. Yes. And one of the interesting things is that combination therapy has allowed us to see more of this than we have ever seen before. Because prior to combination therapy, most patients died before they could, one could observe this accumulated effect of GP120. Now that combination therapy lets you live longer, it doesn't do anything about the GP120. Macrophages play a critical role in regulating the number of T cells in the body. So essentially they induce T cells to kill themselves when they're, if you will, an excess number of T helper cells. You know, let's say um, at the tail end of a strong immune response, what macrophages will do is they secrete a component called fast ligand that induces T cells to kill themselves through a specific receptor on the surfaces of T cells. Interestingly enough, one of the side effects of macrophages being infected by HIV is that they more than double their expression of fast ligand. So from the point of view of the virus, this is great. You're killing more immune cells because you're making macrophages send death signals to T cells. Even though those T cells may not be infected at all, they're still killed indirectly by the macrophages that are infected. So this is a very nasty sort of a phenomenon called the bystander effect, where the innocent bystanders, which are not even infected, are killed. It's one of the reasons why HIV can have such a devastating effect, because it doesn't need to infect the cell to kill the cell. It can do it indirectly through fast ligand. What's what was discovered in the past two years is that fast ligand also has a devastating impact on the central nervous system. So that in, in patients with prolonged HIV infection, fast ligand levels accumulate in the CNS and specifically glial cells and astrocytes are very fast ligand sensitive. So they will kill themselves due to exposure to fast ligand. And as you know, glial cells help to support the structure of neuronal networks. They actually help to sustain neurons and neuronal networks. So that the gradual breakdown of components of the central nervous system we now think is linked to this elevation of fast ligand in the CNS due to the infection, not necessarily of glial cells or astrocytes, but due to the infection of macrophages.
that upregulate their fast ligand production. Can you spell that? Yeah, can you spell that? Fast ligand? Okay. It's FAS ligand. So there's fast ligand and fast receptor. I actually have a whole diagram for you, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. Oh, throw it on. <laughs> Bring it on. Uh, Bring it on? Yeah. All right, we have to go through that. If you have time, we have time. Show the hairy dog, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fast. So the way this works is that in a typical cell, fast ligand, fast ligand can either be secreted or it can be held on the surface of the cell that um, and produced it. Fast ligand actually exists as a trimer. FAS or FAS receptor is on the surface, let's say, of the glial cell. When, FAS, when three FAS receptors bind to the three FAS ligands, that trimerization phenomenon activates what are called death domains inside the cell. This leads to a cascade of activations that ultimately, among other things, lead to the activation of a caspase that in turn activates another enzyme that cleaves DNA. So that what happens is as part of programmed cell death, the genome is degraded. And this is how the FAS interaction actually activates the specific enzyme that breaks down um, the genome of the cell that's undergoing suicide. So that's a signal transduction kind of thing. Exactly. So in fact, programmed cell death is a critical example of a signal transduction pathway. So what happens is the HIV-infected macrophage overexpresses fast ligand. The glial cells are sensitized. They yeah. induce. This pathway is induced. The glial cell kills itself completely inappropriately. So clearly, then we have a situation where these cells are hypersensitized. Well, no, I should back up because I'm assuming something which I haven't told you yet. These cells are sensitive to fast ligand. We have more fast ligand. Now, there's another issue that comes into play. There's a viral protein called TAT. This is a viral protein that greatly enhances the transcription of the provirus in the genome. And, th and this is the last thing that I'll tell you. <laughs> What's amazing about TAT is that TAT freely crosses cell membranes. It does not require a receptor. It does not require a channel or a pump. As you should all know by now, proteins do not get across membranes on their own. That's not supposed to happen. They're way too big. But TAT has a little hydrophobic sequence, and the mechanism is not well understood, that allows it to associate with the membrane and somehow flip across the membrane. So what's interesting is that within the infected cell, TAT is expressed in the cytoplasm, translated in the cytoplasm. It gets back into the nucleus. It hyper um, enhances the transcription of the provirus. That's how it works in the HIV replication cycle. But because TAT can freely cross any membrane, not only does it get into the nucleus of the infected cell, it leaches out into the environment. It diffuses into the environment. So TAT can diffuse into glial cells. Now, the glial cells are not infected right, with HIV. So TAT does not have a provirus to activate or to enhance. What it does instead is it, it enhances the expression of the FAST receptor. So that not only does the infected macrophage overexpress FAST ligand, but the TAT that diffuses from the infected macrophage goes into the glial cell which in turn overexpresses the fast receptor. So TAT so is produced by infected cells? Yes. Okay. So not only is fast ligand overproduced, the glial cell is hypersensitized. <laughs>
based on overexpressing FAS or FAS receptor. So as you can see, a very nasty combination of not only the multifunctional nature of HIV proteins with all sorts of a toxicity effects, but they actually derail and misappropriate normal host cell processes to in fact eventually result in the death of neurons. So clearly, one of the reasons why HIV is so complex and so deadly as a pathogen is because it doesn't have just one way of damaging the immune system. Well, A, it doesn't just damage the immune system, but it has multiple overlapping sort of mechanisms based on multiple functions or effects of the viral proteins. And that ironically, over time, now that combination therapy has bought patients more time, we're seeing the emergence of phenomena that we simply did not have time to see before because the patients died um, too quickly. So what's quite clear is that in the next few years, we're going to get an increasingly clear sense of how neuropathogenesis is derived from this viral infection and what it will continue to uncover for us is the fact that there's this complex weaving of phenomena that result not just in AIDS, but also in dementia and the neuronal effects that we see associated with AIDS. Can I just ask a question about something that happened a couple years back with the vaccination? I mean, it was a pretty hot topic because it was taking place. A lot of the patients were from the Fenway area. Yeah. Um, because it's such a mutagenic virus, it's like, to me, it reminds me of the influenza virus. I mean, you, you get a shot for influenza every year if you're going to be vaccinated against. Is that sort of a hopeless sort of shot at trying to prevent um, even contracting HIV? I mean, I don't know. It feels like we're still treating symptoms. We're still treating symptoms and not actually able to hit the mechanism of the virus right. to eliminate. So. That is true. I mean, I think the vaccine question is a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I could tell you, explain to you why it's so difficult, but HIV co-opts and uses to enhance its own infection many of exactly the same components that vaccines elicit. So, for example, HIV can use antibodies to infect cells. What does a vaccine usually produce? Antibodies. So you can imagine you'd have a vaccine that might produce antibodies that in fact will help the virus colonize the body. This is one of the big challenges of vaccine research. Um, many have argued that we should focus all of our time on vaccine research. But the way the virus functions, though, it's going to be very difficult to get a vaccine that is both safe and absolutely effective in all cases. So that is going to be a major challenge. And it would give a lot of false hope, I think, too, to the education process of, of you know, intravenous drug use, safe sex, Right. That sort of thing is a false sense at this point. And of security. If you have a vaccine, then right. don't worry. Right. Um, you can do whatever you want. Um, right. Well, I think what's also interesting as well is that, you know, the very large vaccine trial that was announced a few years ago, you know, that took place both here and in Thailand, um, was basically a political move. Everyone in the field knew that it wouldn't work. It's safe, but it's useless, functionally. But no vaccine had gone to a large phase three trial. So the government wanted a phase three trial, so it got one. But it was a complete waste of money because everyone knew that that, that, that approach would not work, um, you know, which is really unfortunate. Um, there are some other approaches that are being explored. Some of them involve a more vaccine slash gene therapy um, approach. But we end up with this dangerous precedent of do we want to remodel the human genome? to be able to resist this virus? And what will the long-term consequence of that be, assuming we fully understand how we could do that? What would the long-term consequence be? But I mean, I think HIV and AIDS is a very interesting disease because there is one very simple issue. It's completely preventable. Since 1983, we know how it's transmitted. Blood-borne, intimate sexual contact, transmission in birth simple. It's a completely preventable um, disease. 
but I think it underscores the nature of human behavior, the milieu that human behavior takes place in culturally, why this is so completely out of control. We have known how to stop it since 1983. And what we now have today is the most major um, public health threat that mankind has ever faced. There's no question. Africa, some people have said that Africa is almost a write-off at this point. The continent is going to be devastated by the disease. It already is. There's almost no way around it. I've been at, in some alarming meetings where public policy people say, you know, where economists have said, cut your losses and run. It's, it's over. I mean, the notion of economic development is over for that continent, thanks to this disease. Um, of course, that I feel is a completely unsupportable, unethical way to think about it. But economists are really saying that it's too late. And that if we don't do something, that's going to move in a wave through Southeast Asia, that if China does not contain HIV infection due to the intravenous drug use that's starting up, especially in coastal reason, regions, it will nip China's sort of burgeoning chance to be the next world power, because it has to keep that under control. And so it's a major, major threat. And there's no question about it. But we know how to prevent transmission. But it's not making any difference at all. So. There's a public campaign on, on television. It's only uh, to know. Uh -huh. to know that it's pushing this campaign. When I first saw it, I wasn't quite sure what they were talking about. Then I got it. But is that making any difference, those kind of campaigns? And, and to know, if you know that you've got the HIV virus, OK, so you don't try, you try to monitor your behaviors. You don't, don't, don't uh, transfer it. But is there, um, if you catch the, if you know you've got the AIDS virus earlier, is there, is there, is there a better uh, prognosis for you? Or? Well, f catching it earlier, the prognosis is better. I mean, well, just in terms of the therapy has more time. You have more time with therapy. Combination therapy tends to be more effective if it's later on, if it's earlier, because you don't have quite as diverse a population. Unless, of course, you have been infected by a pre-resistant strain, in which case that's out the window, which is, of course, a major problem. It's not clear if that campaign is having any, any effect. It's fairly recent. Um, as I said, infection rates in terms of numbers are totally steady in the US. They're just going as they ever have. For the last at least seven years, they've been totally steady. There's no apparent decrease in the number of new infections. There hasn't been a significant. I think what's happened is the rate of infection among gay men has fallen. The rate of infection among African Americans has shot way up. And it's actually kind of balanced like that. What is alarming, however, is that there's some concern that the rate of infection among gay men is going to start to increase again. Because over the last year, the rate of, um, of syphilis among gay men in New York and San Francisco has gone up by probably eightfold in the, in the last year, which means that if you're contracting syphilis, you're not practicing safe sex. So the, the expectation is there may be a jump, a, a, you know, sort of a notch up in that group. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, we were talking about, I have two questions. One is that we're, I'm assuming that people are really studying the chimpanzees and the immune system and how the HIV virus they're trying to, it's an endangered species. That would make sense. We don't. So my, well, that leads to my other question. It's like, when you look at HIV and we talk about how complex it is and how it's just this wonderful killing machine in us, we talk about how it's been around in chimpanzees for a thousand years. Is it older than a lot of the other diseases that we have? Like, you know, in comparison with other diseases that affect us, has HIV been around just? Not even in humans, but in, in primates? In Possibly. I mean, in terms of a disease, in terms of a pathogen that, that affects the immune system, it's thought that its relationship to a primate immune system is longer you know, than any that we know, which is what is disturbing. You might wonder why on earth has, have the chimps evolved to deal with this uh, um, pathogen. Well, they may have had no choice. But also, it is possible that the, that the chimpanzee immune system is more robust because of this constant back and forth you know, with the virus over the life of the chimp. Which would make us more robust over time. Over time. Mm -hmm. Over time, if we took the consequence of it. Right. 
backing in all of that conversation. Um, I was wondering, has anyone looked into uh, artificially or chemically or, or somehow making new CD4 receptors so that you can sort of make up for that loss that happens? And well, in terms of regenerating new yeah. cells? Yes, yes. I mean, there, there have been look, uh, a lot of work has gone into looking at certain, for example, interferons and interleukins to stimulate that process. They're very, it's very um, difficult, though, because, for example, with IL-2, interleukin-2, it activates the proliferation of CD4 cells, but you need to get the dose just right, because if the dose is too high, the cells that it activates become more efficient at producing virus. So you'll see a bump up in viremia. So that's a problem. Also, IL-2 therapy long term potentially can cause cancer. And so it's, IL-2 has promise, but we haven't figured out the dosage issue at all. Of the world? Yeah. Well, you have raised sort of a thorny point. Some have argued that <clears throat> if it was Canada, not Africa, things would be very different. If it were Western Europe, not Africa, things would be very different. And that may very well be true. Uh. I mean, in some ways one could argue that if the governments of the world had taken action in the 80s aggressively, we wouldn't be in this place um, right now. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard to say, though, because as I said, we know how to stop transmission. Um, the argument is, well, all you need is education. It's not working here. So if education is not working here, why on earth would it work in Africa, where the situation is even more dire and more complex in terms of you know, you know, what because, I mean, the whole, the whole problem with safe sex, <clears throat> in part, is that most safe sex programs are predicated on the notion that you have the ability to say no. And it's quite clear that the power dynamic is very variable. Even here in the US, the power dynamic is very variable. So that you know, your ability to say no may, in fact, be quite limited, not counting your access to condoms, your access to education, your access to anything else. So with sort of a socioeconomic imbalance, a gender imbalance in terms of power, if you're a sex worker, can you really say no? There are market forces that may drive you to not, you know, that may drive you to say yes. I mean, can these programs really work just based on the simple principle that, well, I'll just tell them no. Um, that may not really be an option. What is the best hope for it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best hope probably is going to is probably going to be something that's a cross between a therapy and a vaccine. There are some hopes for therapeutic vaccines that won't be a hundred percent effective, but will at least reduce the infection rate significantly. Um, I think that is the best hope. In this country, it's very unlikely, even if we had a vaccine, it would ever be applied. 
because the connection of AIDS still with sex, with drug use, will prevent, every, will prevent most people from taking it. Um, so I think in this country, perhaps, education is the answer. I don't think there's going to be one answer globally. I think therapy is going to be the answer, perhaps, in the, in the developing world, and one that's freely available. Um, some have argued that the way to go <clears throat> is to do some sort of retrovirally driven genome modification. So that, for example, there's a, you know, there's a researcher here at Harvard at the Primate Center that has been at the leading forefront of modifying sort of a weakened version of HIV and to introduce that to the human genome. And that it would be a, vac a, live, va a live vaccine that would not only would it be cheap, but you could actually effect sexual vaccination. So you would vaccine, you'd pass on the vaccine to your sexual partners. The problem is we don't know yet how to prevent that vaccine from becoming pathogenic. But if Ron DeRosier can actually achieve that, that will perhaps be a solution for us. Um, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs>